Hello and welcome once again to the Blueprints. This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton Fourth Lakes Brock, with new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program, share this program. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. And of course, if you can't watch or listen to the entire program right this second, download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there. Today, this topic is something that's kind of been on my mind since we first talked about it a few weeks ago with our agriculture and agri-food critic John Barlow, the Member of Parliament for Foothills in Alberta. And it is this idea that the Liberals are floating, that they want to reduce fertilizer use in Canada by 30%, which would absolutely devastate our agriculture industry. So to talk a bit more about this, because this is extremely important. And again, it's probably a message you're not hearing about in the mainstream media at this exact moment. So I'm bringing on a good friend of the show, Warren Steinle, Member of Parliament for Regina Louvain in the beautiful province of Saskatchewan. Thanks for coming on board. Absolutely, Jamie. Happy to be here and happy to talk about an issue that's going to be very important now and into the future because it's going to really revolve around food security for Canadians and for the world. So thank you very much for having me on. Well, it looks like the Liberals' uh, conversation on this is, is changing a bit. So uh, at first, they were talking about setting up consultations with farmers and interest groups all across the country to talk about how they can reduce the fertilizer use in Canada by 30%, which would, again, absolutely devastate food production in this country. But again, now they're getting a bit of pushback, it seems. Now they're saying, well, maybe it was voluntary after all. I don't know about you, Warren, in your area. I know in my area. Farmers, like everybody else, they don't use too much of their product because if they do, they're going to lose money. They use exactly what is needed at the exact time and moment. Exactly, Jamie, and you're bang on. We were actually fortunate enough to have John Barlow out in Regina, Saskatchewan here a couple of weeks ago. And myself, Andrew Shear, and him had a meeting with around 40 agriculture stakeholders that represented different groups across Saskatchewan. And that's what they said. The message was farmers don't want to use more inputs than they can. So it affects their bottom line. And also they're great stewards of the land. So they're making sure the technology is so good right now. I had an opportunity to go to a Yara incubator test site during Ag in Motion up by Saskatoon. And they have such technology now where they've mapped all the fields. They have a machine that you can put to 13 leaves, 30 leaves on. And it tells you the exact amount of fertilizer they should use at the exact time to the decimal spot. So I think people in Ottawa that are making these policies up as they go, don't realize the technology that is being used in agriculture in Western Canada and Saskatchewan at this moment and how well they're doing and ensuring that they use as least amount of fertilizer as possible for the fields that they're producing. That's actually a very good point, Warren, and I'm glad you brought that up. Technology, especially in agriculture and the food industry, is moving so fast. It, it, most farmers are always using the best technology, the best information they can have, as quickly as they can get it. This is, this is a sector that, that thrives on innovation. And I think sometimes it's overlooked. Yes, in so many of these agribusinesses, farmers have these big farms, they have agrologists and professionals that come out and help them decide what they should produce in which year, what field they need to put a different crop in. So these professional agrologists are making sure that these farm, the farmers are being great stewards of the land, that, which they have always been. And one thing that they don't realize is if you reduce the amount of fertilizer, yields will go down. That is an absolute. And every producer will tell you that if they want to reduce the use of fertilizer, that means it's going to affect every Canadian. This is not an urban versus rural issue, not an east versus west issue. If you eat food in Canada, this bad policy by this liberal government is going to affect you and food prices are going to continue to rise and it's going to hurt the most vulnerable once again. And it's just bad public policy put forth by a government and an agriculture minister that doesn't understand agriculture in Western Canada. Well, from the article from the uh, CBC posted August 5th, it's got a picture of you and John Barlow and Andrew Shear on the uh, on the article. So as you just mentioned, farm industry groups, and it's right here in this article, CBC, farm industry groups say there's no simple or viable way to reduce nitrous oxide emissions without reducing the use of fertilizers, um, which will again lower crop yields. And of course, we export a lot. We feed 
uh, a good chunk of the world with our export. We could probably be doing more. But if the government is going to go through with this, which now they're saying it's voluntary, two seconds ago, it was coming on, uh, you know, they're thinking about it for 2030. Um, we could be doing a lot more in helping uh, reduce poverty. We're reducing uh, food insecurity in, in places around the world that are struggling with that. Well, that's exactly right, Jamie. And we saw the same thing that was done to our energy sector. Right now, we could be doing more to help out countries like Germany and make sure they don't need Russian gas. And they're doing the same thing in agriculture, that they're trying to lower what we can do in Canada, which Canadian agriculture is produced 70% more environmentally friendly than most other countries around the world. So what we could be doing now is ensuring that people are getting sustainably made food and, and food products, shipping them to countries that need them and helping feed the world's hungry people. So I think that's something that needs to be put in perspective is we need to have a government roadblocks in front of our industries and start helping them so that we can be a leader in the world when it comes to food security and energy security because we see bad policy after bad policy affect some of our most productive sectors and that's something that needs to stop and look what's happening happening in the netherlands they the government is purposely trying to shut down thirty thousand farms in in the netherlands and this is this is a country that produces a way above their weight in terms of agriculture outputs. It, it is staggering to me that the, the government purposely would want to shut down their food production, would, would shut down the ability for trade, economic opportunity, jobs, innovation, wealth, technology, all to meet these arbitrary goals. Meanwhile, where will those countries that are receiving that food replace that with? What other country is able to ramp up their exports that fast in order to, to meet the, the, the products that's being taken off the market by the government of the Netherlands? And, and we don't want to see the same thing happen here. Well, the answer to help, to help feed the world is Canada could ramp up their production of, of food products. But unfortunately, this government is going down a similar path. Another thing being done in the Netherlands is they're taking arable land out of farm production. And that's an actual goal of the government. When food security is something that's been talked about around the world, why on earth would any government look at taking arable land out of food production when it's something that is being seen as more important each and every year from people around the world? And the fear is in Canada right now is if you aren't gonna meet some of these subjective emission targets, then you may not be able to take part in some of the BRM programs, business risk management programs that the governments are offering. And that's a fear we heard loud and clear from some of the stakeholders in Regina that we met with that day is, if this is gonna be voluntary, does that mean that if we don't make and have a plan, then we can't take part in some of the business risk management programs that are offered to the government? And that's a real concern out here in Western Canada. And it's something that needs to be taken seriously. Another thing that people don't realize is there's been some studies done by industry groups and these fertilizer reduction targets set by this government could take out $48 billion worth of profit in the agriculture sector in our country. And that's $48 billion with a B. And that's something that people are scared about. And when the economy is looking like it's heading in a downturn, taking that much money out of our economy at a time where we need to be growing our economy so people can be making paychecks is something that is very worrisome to the agriculture stakeholders we spoke to. I'm glad you brought this up too, because this is the issue I have sometimes with, with government grants, especially with this liberal government and, and how they have their agenda. It's not necessarily the best widget maker that gets the, the grant to, to innovate and, and come up with the new great thing. It's usually the group that's connected to government or has you know, the right lobbyists, the right lawyers, or they have predetermined innovation, right? The government will determine, well, we want the widget to look like this. Well, if we got the grant, we're going to have to make the widget like this. Is it the best way to make it? I don't know. Is it is it more cost efficient? Who knows? But it, it is a barrier to competition. It, it hurts the free market. It hurts innovation. It hurts technology. You still probably get some innovation. I think every country, whether they're communist or socialist, does have innovation, but you don't have the rapid innovation you have if you reduce barriers, lower taxes, allow people to develop what the market wants to see. And, and in our agriculture sector, they are using the best technology. They want to continue to do that, reduce their emissions at the same time, and they're already doing it in so many other cases. There are examples 
all over this country of farmers trying to reduce their inputs, trying to reduce their, their, their footprint. And I think we're doing a heck of a job, but they get absolutely no credit from this government. Yeah, that's another thing, Jamie, is any of the innovations that happened before 2018, which is once again, another random date that they picked, won't count towards emission reduction targets. So any innovation has to happen after 2018, which anyone that's been involved in, in the farm sector knows how far we've come in the last 15 years on, on innovation and technology. And the, it was just another subjective date picked by this government that said, no, any innovation that happens and we're, you're going to get credit for your emission reductions has to happen after 2018, which is something that is very troublesome for the farm industry right now. And we talked about that at that stakeholder meeting also. And it was another another subjective date that the government picked for some reason. But just to get back to talking about innovation and the government sometimes just needs to get out of the way. When I was on the agriculture committee, I spoke with one of the senior uh, bureaucrats in Ottawa. And he talked about how the government needs to foster innovation in the agriculture sector. So I asked him, I said, what government program uh, bring forward zero tillage? None. It was a private sector that came up with innovation and technology and, and drills so you could do zero till. What innovation was it that brought forward crop rotation? None. It was people realizing that the fields needed time to rest and different crops put in different nutrients. Rotational grazing for producers, another thing. There wasn't a like forest government program that made people rotational graze their cattle. They used to realize it was better for the land and they came to these new innovative ideas on their own. So I said, it doesn't have to be a government program to initiate innovation in the agriculture sector. They're doing fine on their own. Sometimes the government just should get out of the way and leave our agriculture producers alone. That's, I, you couldn't have said it better. Like The government picks winners and losers. It doesn't innovate. It produces regulations and rules that oftentimes stifle or slow down innovation in certain sectors, and they create barriers to competition. Government is not an innovator. The private sector is the innovator. The free market will provide. And when we talk about energy, I think as conservatives, we're talking about A plus B. The, the left always talks about B minus A, right? They, they, they want to get rid of our, our fossil fuel industry and only rely on wind turbines and solar panels. Well, that's not going to produce the energy we need, nor is it going to produce the energy that the world needs to get off Russian oil, for example, or oil from Venezuela. It doesn't matter. There are bad actors. We need to displace those bad actors. We do that by producing abundance. Abundance equals peace. Shortage equals strife. No, that's very well said, Jamie, and I think that's something that this government doesn't understand. And the reason why is they're, they're all in touch. They're all in touch with the actual builders and producers of what we do well. They, they have a certain group of people that they listen to, and they say and, and speak their uh, wokeism back to them, and they, they hear from them exactly what they want to hear. But when they come out to Saskatchewan, I think they're surprised and don't understand why we have some big issues with the policy direction this government's going, especially in the agriculture don't understand that there are good, great agribusinesses that are innovating each and every day to make sure that they're doing better to sustain their environment. And I think that's something that this government needs to really take a step back and start listening to other people than what they what they want to hear. They, they just hear a, a parrot speaking back to them. And this government really needs to get out of the Ottawa bubble and, and talk to some real people. But I don't think that's what they want to do, Jamie. I think they just want to stay in the Ottawa bubble and do the Ottawa's no, knows best approach. You can see it with some of the legislation they did with the, the green framework. They didn't talk to the people. And we, we talked earlier about the consultation process. Well, this government put this policy in place before they consulted anyone. They did it backwards, as always. They put a policy in place Arbitrage. and then they went out and said, hey, what do you guys think about this? Well, if the policy is already in place and you've made your decision, Everyone knows you're just doing fake consultation right now to try and make yourselves feel better and try and make your friends in the media be able to say, oh, no, they did talk to, to producers. Well, they did a, a six and they made the policy before they even talked to the people that was going to affect. And we also hear lots over and over again that the, the left cares about the poor. And I think every party cares about the poor. We want to ensure that people are able to lift themselves out of poverty and find opportunity and, and, and live the Canadian dream. If this goes forward, who do you think this policy is going to hurt more? It's going to be those on the lower end of the income scale. If you skyrocket, prices of groceries are already through the roof. If you make that go higher, 
What do you think is going to happen? Energy is already through the roof. The tank of gas is incredible right now. And now you're going to say, well, in, in, in eight more years, we're thinking about reducing the farmers in Canada, their ability to, to use fertilizer and have them reduce, which will mean less crops, which will mean uh, less food output. What do you think is going to happen to the existing food supply? It's going to go out of control, hurting those that probably, well, definitely uh, need the protection the most, which is the availability of food in abundance. Yeah, it's going to hurt the most vulnerable, Jamie, 100%. Healthier foods are going to be cost more money. And the people that live in uh, Rosedale where Minister Freeland, li Freeland live won't find a difference if they have to pay an extra $4 for a loaf of bread. But the single mother that is trying to support two kids on a lower paying job, that's who it's going to affect. They're going to be able to have most vulnerable people are not going to be able to afford the food they need to have a healthy lifestyle. It's the same as the carbon tax. When heating bills go up, it doesn't affect people that drive $100,000 cars. It affects people that take the bus to work. And I think that's something that this government is completely out of touch with the average hardworking Canadian and how hard it is under this government to get the job done and make ends meet. I think that's something that's very important is I've talked to many people in Saskatchewan over the summer, Jamie, and not one person said they're in a better situation financially than they were five years ago. There's very few Canadians that are better off after this government's been in power for seven years and the policies that they're bringing forward are just making it harder and harder for families to make ends meet and something that needs to be stopped and then they need to listen to what Canadians are going through and actually have some empathy for Canadians. And right now they're just stubbornly going down this path of ideology towards uh, climate extremism. And I think we need to really take a step back and see how this is affecting the day-to-day -day, day -day lives of Canadians. Well, one way to, to help us get off fossil fuels and reduce our our, demand, our, our need for them is technology innovation. How do you do that? Use the free market, reduce taxes, lower the government implications into your life and allow people to do what they do best, which is innovate. Warren, I have so many more questions for you, but unfortunately we are running out of time. As you know, the, the guests always get the last word. So with that, I open the floor to you. Yeah, I just want to repeat, this isn't an issue when it comes to fertilizer reduction of or urban versus rural. This isn't a issue that's going to affect each and every Canadian as goes to the grocery store to buy food. So what we need to do is get out there and tell our story, tell our very good story about how we are producing food that is environmentally friendly and we can feed the world. And we need to make sure that our friends in urban Canada know that Western Canadians are doing a great job environmentally. We're great stewards of the land. And we just want to make sure that we can get the job done and have government get out of our way. I love it. Warren Steinley, Member of Parliament, Regina Luban. We do appreciate his time. A good friend of the show. Appreciate you coming on again. If you like what you've heard, if you like what you watch, please comment, subscribe, share this program. I guarantee you this is something the mainstream media isn't giving the attention it should. And of course, if you can't down, uh, listen to the entire program right this second, download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it. It is out there. Together, we can push back against this ever-moving liberal agenda and ensure that this is Justin Trudeau's last term as Prime Minister here in Canada. So, new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We do appreciate your time doing this. Until then, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.